Okay, hi everybody. Today is Tuesday, August 13th, and you are at the brand spanking new bi-weekly, every other weekly uh, Kubernetes SIG testing meeting. Uh, I am your host, Aaron of SIGBeard, and uh, you are all being publicly recorded. Uh, you will find yourselves on YouTube later where you can watch yourselves adhere to the Kubernetes code of conduct by being your very best selves. I wanted to try something slightly different with the meeting agenda since we've changed up our meeting schedule today uh, by taking some time to welcome any new attendees, but I know everybody here. Um, so the next thing I wanted us to do was to just walk through sub-project updates, uh, but unfortunately I haven't been available to get the owners for those sub-projects to show up today, but I still did just want to call something out real quickly. So I will share my screen. Uh, so in the recurring topics section, I'm linking out to the sub projects. So if I click on kind, for example, I can go see that uh, kind is this thing here, uh, lives in this repo, this Slack channel. And if you want to go to the kind meeting, here's their agenda. So I could stock them and give them their own update if their meeting agenda is up to date. So that's what's going on with KIND. Uh, similar deal for Testing Commons. Testing Commons is the sub-project that's all about, like we want to sort of improve the code structure and layout of the way that tests are written. There's a lot of work going on these days around sort of refactoring the E2E framework um, and making it more reusable for people. I don't know why I got dropped all the way to the bottom of the dock. Um, uh, but anyway, active community of people who are doing fun things like killing my favorite anti-pattern of expect error not to have occurred. We're finally like linting that out uh, and trying to put together some better hygiene on how to write end-to-end -end tests. Um, from the test infra side, I just wanted to call out the fact that we organize our work based on milestone. Uh, so at present, we have 32 open issues in the milestone that represents this quarter. Um, I feel like at some point we should go through and do a grooming session to figure out which of these are actually still relevant or not, um, especially given that uh, people's names aren't assigned to all of these. Most of the ones that don't have assignees are like help wanted issues. Uh, and the help wanted issues are in our current milestone to let people know that is actually relevant work that we would really like people to work on. Um, and if we still find it's really important to complete this quarter and nobody else does it, we may, we may end up having to take it on. Um, same thing for Prow specifically. Uh, I still believe that we have plans of sort of breaking Prow up into its own separate code base, at the very least separate the Prow code from the Prow config. So if you're interested in just working on Prow related things, here are the issues in our current milestone that are just related to Prowl. Um, this maybe gets into the conversation of how we have like a bunch of labels for different Prowl subcomponents like deck and hook and uh, other stuff. And it's unclear to me how useful that is for people to understand like what needs work and what are we working on. Um, so, with that, I think I'm going to move over to the open discussion unless anybody has any questions on that stuff. And the first part of open discussion would be Miranda Christ. Uh, Christ? Christ. Miranda Christ, uh, who's going to walk us through the deck rerun button. So I will stop sharing my screen and mute and all that good stuff. So, oh, <laughs> um, sorry about that. I am going to talk about the work I've been doing on the rerun button in Prowess front end, um, which is this button that's highlighted right here. And so before I started working on it, the workflow looked a little bit like this. You would click on the button, it would give you a command that you could paste into the terminal if you had cluster access. 
And if you didn't have cluster access, you had to ask someone who did to run it for you. Um, and so I have been working on improving that to where now, let's see if my animation works. If you click the rerun button, the job runs directly. Um, and so this doesn't actually work for everyone. We have a permission system set up. So basically, at least on Kate's Prowl, um, you need to be logged into GitHub. And if your username matches a list of authorized users, it'll work for you. Um, and so the way we have it configured right now is test in for admins, which is basically the on-call rotation can trigger all jobs. Um, this next point is not actually deployed yet. It will be soon. But the same logic as slash test will be used for pre-submit. So that means any pre-submit job that has the OK to test label can be rerun by anyone. Um, or if you could apply the OK to test label if you're a trusted user, then you can rerun any pre-submit job. Um, we also have the option to specify job specific config. So if you think that a specific GitHub team should be able to rerun a specific job or that you individually should be able to rerun a specific job, um, you can let me know on Slack and I can update the config so you can rerun that job. Um, and if you have your own Prow instance, you can set this up as well and use that same permission system. Um, and the instructions for setting that up are in the design doc, which is linked in the agenda. So I'm actually an intern. I'm leaving soon. Um, so I thought I would talk about some future work. Yeah, I'm actually leaving on Friday. <laughs> no, <laughs> gotta make sure that it's plenty. Um, one thing that we would definitely like to see is a rerun button on Spyglass. I don't think I'll have time to implement that. So if anyone wants to take that over, that would be great. Um, also an option to re-resolve refs. So if you're rerunning a job and the refs have changed since the original run, um, just like a pop-up that asks you whether you want to re-resolve those refs. Um, and if anyone has any ideas for anything that they want to add on, you're welcome to add that. I think at this point, the people who know my project best are Cole and Eric. So if you have any questions about that after I leave, they would be good people to talk to. Um, and I just want to say thanks to everyone who helped me out did code reviews, um, reviewed my design doc and everything. So, yeah. Um, well, thank you for making all of that actually happen. Anyone have any questions? Uh, so Daniel had asked about testing for admins. I'm assuming that's the GitHub team. Is that right? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, and only org members can see the team. Well. Uh, so technically, if I link you to that, that is correct. Uh, if I search for testing for admins in the org repo, um, okay, see if you can see that link, Daniel. Um, also, if you're not an org member and you would like to become one, I am happy to be your sponsor. The bar for org membership is uh, certainly a confusing thing for some people. It's, it's mainly that we want to ensure that we're interested in contributing to Kubernetes. It's not like we're going to say you have to have written this many PRs that are this big in order to become a member. It's more that we want to make sure you're actually willing to stick around and, and do some work. But, for those people who are not org members, it was very important for us to have a publicly auditable version of our teams uh, so that people would see that. Um, Miranda, do you have an example of the config that we could, you could just share with us so we can sort of see how it's configured today? Yes, somewhere. Because uh, I, like, I personally know I've heard requests for this from, so you showed DIMS as an example in there. I know people from the, the Kate's infrastructure working group have a number of 
uh, a number of jobs related to container image promotion that are implemented as post submits where it's like ordinarily the only way they trigger is upon a merge. And so if that one trigger fails, we'd love for some way to rerun that. It seems like, uh, I mean, you tell me, it seems like we don't really have people ask for periodics to get re-triggered all that often. Okay. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't think people know that I have the power to let them re-trigger jobs. <laughs> so nobody has asked me. Okay, that link has the current config for like, like the global permissions. Um, so that says that testing for admins can rerun any job and also I can rerun any job. All right, so I'm just sharing my screen so we can take a look at that. So does it, um, what would it look like if I wanted to like add the ability for certain people to trigger certain jobs? Is that something that this config will support? Yeah, yeah. so you just have the same rerun auth config struct in like the specific jobs config. Okay. So this one right here is in like the deck deployment, I think. Yeah. This is or the deck yeah. config. Yeah. Um, and, and so just like I think at the same level that you would put the job type or like job name, you would have this new math config. Okay. Cool. Uh, any other questions? I muted so I can't really hear. But I don't see anybody going <laughs> off of mute, so I'm going to take that as a uh, thank you for showing that to us, Miranda. Thank you for making the burden of on call a lot uh, simpler and for empowering more of the community to do what they need through self service. And please don't leave. <laughs> <laughs> um, we will miss you. Okay. Uh, next up on the agenda, um, I have invited Michelle here today to talk to us about our plans for open sourcing test grid. Michelle, do you want to take it away? No, but, um, okay, testing, is picking up audio? Try again. Testing? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so I think, um, like, okay, one moment, what am I gonna do? That's good. Um, so recently, like we got actual um, progress made on open sourcing test grid. Um, instead of being in the kind of awkward position of uh, exactly what are we open sourcing, how, et cetera, we are actually like full go ahead on updating the uh, test grid updater. Um, we'll determine more on the front end later, but for now, um, the updater is gonna be a substantial amount of work anyway. So. Um, I posted an update in the open source issue. Let me see if I can share my screen real quick. Okay. Anyways, um, so there's an update on the open source issue for like uh, open source planning. Um, I have an actual like thing all the way noted at the bottom. Um, that is actual like plans for uh, what we want to do in uh, later this year. So currently, um, those plans include uh, mostly like updating, or sorry, uh, open sourcing parts of the updater itself. Um, things like the uh, jobs that run post update, like um, people are probably familiar with uh, summarizer and alerter as things that make the summary and the things that send emails to people. Um, the important part, though, that I want to poke about is this part, which is um, in order to kind of uh, clarify what test grid is for. Um, I would like to propose moving the like test grid code that we have existing into its own repository. Um, there is a existing repository that we can now use, which is under, I think I can just say, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, it's under Google Cloud Platform slash test grid. Um, we have very basic stuff there, uh, but I would like to actually move the stuff from test infra over to that new repo. Um, the process and whatnot for everything should be about the same. We're going to be using Prow for like Prowy goodness. Um, the like code itself should just be forked off of the existing stuff. Um, we still plan on making sure that it works with Prow, making sure that it works for Kubernetes, making sure that the Kubernetes instance is all good. 
but mainly I just want to make it uh, clear that it's not a like Kubernetes only thing. Um, and also like, actually that's, that's mostly it. There's some other things with it. Um, what this should mean for people is uh, aside from a short, probably like don't commit while we're moving code over from the repo, which hopefully should not be a very long period. Um, everything should basically be the same. I think the only other difference is that the CLI process for making contributions should be slightly different because it will be the Google CLA and not the CNCF CLA and whatnot, but um, approximately the same process. And then hopefully this will mean that we have like all of the um, momentum pushing forward for actually like getting all of that code in open source and making sure that people can contribute to it and then see the fruits of their contributions uh, reflected in actual production test grid as we start moving more and more of that into GitHub. So yeah. Does that mean that I'm super excited, that excited about this because I have a link to this issue on the slides from KubeCon 2018. I was like, this is the only part of our stack that is not <laughs> open source. Yeah, I, I think that was a big, uh, I want to say motivator necessarily, but like it's definitely very exciting to finally have this as like a, hey, we are open sourcing it. Like we have said we would, um, we are actually doing it now. I saw somebody go off me if you have any questions. Yes. <laughs> Does that mean end of September I could start using TestGrid in my own fork? That's a good question. Um, I would guess, I think you could use a very limited set of test grid, um, if anything, let me think. Um, so I would say probably end of December is more likely for like actually being able to spin up your own updater that can like read results from a bucket, translate them to test grid state, show up on the actual test grid dashboards. Um, I think we're going to be trying to move as close to that as possible, but I don't want to target, like, given that we're halfway through August, um, I'm not sure about end of September right now, because there's, like, some existing stuff that we're discovering is, like, oh, yeah, um, we totally assumed for, like, internal Google with some hacks on top to make it work for external, like, Kubernetes instance. We definitely need to go fix that. Um, but, yeah. We're happy to try out. The developers for our project are waiting for test grids. And right now, we <laughs> basically have a backlog. Maybe put a entry onto the Kubernetes test grid dashboard, then we see it there. But if we just wait another month or two and can say that we can move on to our own test grid, that would be even better. Yeah, I, I would say in terms of moving on to your own test grid, so as noted, this will be the updater. So spinning up your own front end, if you need it, um, to be on a different front end instance besides the Kubernetes uh, instance, that's still gonna be a bit. I'm I'm going to guess right now, probably Q1 of next year. Um, so like March-ish. Uh, in terms of like running your own results and whatnot, I think that should be much more likely. And yeah, I'll say like end of December is probably more likely. Um, but if we get it done before then, then super bonus. And I will note that. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, thank you. Uh, Hi, I'm Sean. Hello. Hi. I came in very late. Um, what project was that that you said you were interested in spinning up your own test grid? Uh, I'm from the Kima project. Kima project. Okay. All right. Uh, we'll keep that in mind. Yeah. <laughs> if there's any like parts you're particularly interested in, or like, um, I'll make a note on the repo as well when it's like which parts are open for contributing more and which parts are like. There, there's going to be a kind of split of like, this is kind of open for contributions and this is actually running in production test grid because we have some like purchase gap or yeah, purchase across there. So um, yeah, I, I think mostly I'll, I'll do this when I have the repo. I will uh, go ahead and like try and keep that repo current and also update this issue still. I'll keep an eye on it. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry for all the uh, anyway. Whatever, I, I am trying desperately to like handle the mic and stuff. Uh, so I have, I have uh, two thoughts, uh, one thought, one question on this. So the question is right now we have a lot of tests that run against our test grid config and our prow jobs to kind of enforce some common conventions between them. We also have some tests that make sure that a test grid config is like valid and wouldn't blow up test grid. Um, 
how are we going to keep like the test grid sort of convention tests in our repo uh, but move the other validation tests elsewhere or is the intent more that the the sort of validation tests are something that can be packaged up such that we just run those as like a generic smoke test or whatever against the configs that we have in our repo. Yeah, so, um, and John, if you want to speak to this a bit uh, as well, feel free, but mostly like, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Okay. Um, the, there are some bits that are like more related to the Kubernetes config specifically, like around the YAML files or around the things working with proud jobs. Um, which I think could go either way. They can stay in the Kate's repo as like a, this is some testing for specific stuff for this repo, or like they can maybe in a slightly more generalized form go into the test grid repo. It's like, these are a good utility if you are also using YAML files and you want to make sure of things, or like you want to make sure it works with Prow. Um, a few of those uh, things like the actual thing testing the config validity um, that should go into test grid since it's like a, uh, verification of the overall like test grid options. Um, I'm gonna like, I think I have a few more things to add to that and I will also make that more clear, but yeah. So I think the answer is like a split of should be with test grid because it's testing test grid concepts and like can go with test grid if we think it's a useful utility. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to add to that a little bit. Hello again. Um, there is an open issue for specifically that. Um, splitting off the specific stuff from the more generic stuff. Um, as far as what goes into uh, repository specific and what becomes generic for everyone to use or decide not to use, um, kind of depends on uh, interest, which is why I'm like, I want to get voices from like uh, Kaima and Nistio and other people who want to spin up their own test grids. Because then we can determine, oh, everyone uses these tests, but just Kubernetes uses these tests. And then we can kind of draw that line. Right. Like the example I have in mind is, so something I would consider to be like a test grid, test grid upstream sort of test that I don't want to rewrite, I'm happy to consume though, is like, does a dashboard group actually have dashboard tabs or is it completely empty? Right. You know, does a dashboard tab refer to an actual test group or is it referring to something that does not exist? I feel like I want some tool, utility or test to tell me about those basics. But then Kubernetes probably cares about like every proud job should have an associated test group and mm -hmm. like test groups or, or uh, and then like dashboard tabs should only fall within this naming convention where like we're allowing test dashboard tabs for SIGs and companies who are members of our community. And so those conventions I want, you know, tested sort of downstream of test grid in our region. Yeah, so I, I think things like those big specifications are definitely like live with the Kubernetes test infra. Like there's a very um, standard way of doing things like the test group names and whatnot. The other things that are like um, the dashboard groups, dashboard tabs, like uh, things that are, you can't enable um, these two mutually exclusive options. Um, those are definitely for test grid. Um, I think I'm interested in potentially having configurator in there as well for like EML yeah. to proto. Um, and maybe even the project stuff, but it will depend on exactly how specific we think those are. But yeah, I, I think those are good examples. Cool. They are. Um, and again, I think that depends on our like our users, because I know that there are people who aren't Kubernetes who want to use test grid. Yes. But I don't know how many people that aren't using Prow that want to use test grid. So if we have a bunch of different users from a bunch of different repositories that all also use Prow, then our Prow Kubernetes or Prow uh, test grid integrating tools will be really useful. Yep. But and I suspect that will be the case for like I we're not going to make it like necessary that you use Prow or test grid. I don't think, but I think we like intend to make sure that the two of them work because it's like really nice to be able to use Prow and have like test results to go to and vice versa for like test grid and actually going back to job results and things like that. Like the integration is nice. So I. You suspect that a lot of people who are using it, um, Kubernetes or not, are probably going to be doing both. So, like the utilities in there, kind of makes sense. Cool. Thanks. the The other random thought I had. Um, so, if there's, uh, you may not necessarily be able to stand up your own instance of Test Grid today or within a quarter from now, maybe by the end of the year, but 
what this will empower is people who want to change things or streamline certain uh, user experiences with test grid should be capable of doing that as we bring more components online. So if there are ways where like, for example, I know it took us a while to add like time zone localization to test grid. And I would love for some other person within the community who doesn't live in the Pacific time zone to remind us that there are other time zones in the world by contributing something that supports time zone localization. I know I was reminded of it every time I went out to the East Coast of the United States to visit my folks or whenever I happened to be in Europe for a Kubernetes conference. So I sympathize with that plight. But uh, so this is about sort of growing the pool of people who can make those kinds of contributions to test grid. Another, and so I feel like people who are on the release team or who are interested in helping out the Kubernetes release team uh, might want to check this stuff out when it comes to like improving the relevance of the summarizer or the metrics that we're looking at or stuff. Those are all things that can be on the table down the line. Yeah, I'm, I'm particularly excited for the um, summaries and alerter, I think, are going to be some of the first things out there. Uh, another person on the team has already done, like, a good amount of work, um, if anyone knows Sony, um, has done a good amount of work on, like, uh, trying to get our existing summarizer to work. And then, um, like, there's still a bit of work to do on that, but, like, it'd be great to see some more complicated things happen in summarizer that can then be used in other places and whatnot. So um, same for alerter, like if we want um, better email alerts in general, like the things someone was mentioning where like you can get an overall view for like a, uh, the summary or the alert for a dashboard instead of every single dashboard tab that you want to subscribe to under a dashboard, which can be literal hundreds. Um, like that kind of stuff should be contributable to like, by the end of this quarter, I would hope, and then should be like actually usable. Okay, uh, thanks so much for your time, Michelle. I appreciate it. Looking forward to more open source. Um, okay, next I'm gonna move to um, new job health dashboards. So, um, I'm going to take a little bit longer than just jumping straight to the dashboard because I want to sort of demonstrate how this data gets here, how I'm querying it, and then what I'm doing with this data to understand if this is useful. So broadly speaking, uh, when I was released lead for 114, I put in place a number of criteria for whether or not a job could be blocking. I will start to go to that thing now. So if I go to the Kubernetes SIG release repo uh, and I go to release blocking jobs, we have this list of criteria where like jobs must finished eh, jobs must finish in 120 minutes or less. They must run at least every three hours. They must be capable of passing three times in a row against the same commit. They must have passed 75 percent of all their runs. Um, but we have not historically measured or enforced this stuff. Um, also, we recognize that humans kind of need to take a look at this to understand. Maybe there's a reason this is happening now and it will eventually be fixed. So there is data that we have available today when we look at all jobs, not just data that um, TestGrid has, but also um, data that ends up in BigQuery. The data gets into BigQuery by way of this program called Kettle. Um, it's basically just a bunch of Python uh, that periodically scrapes all of our GCS buckets and uh, dumps that data into BigQuery, and then also sets up something that listens to pub sub events and puts that data into the BigQuery data set. And so um, I'm looking at a table called week. There are also tables called uh, day, which represent all of the builds for the last day. There's also the all table, which is all of our builds ever uh, when we set this up, which is at least two years worth of data. Um, so I point out the day and week things because I, uh, I can't stress enough, this is a publicly queryable data set. So anybody is capable of running queries against this data set. And it's really easy to run against sort of the day and week tables and not use up a whole bunch of data. Anybody with a GCP account, uh, free or not, can use BigQuery. You don't get charged up until you have used a terabyte's worth of data. Uh, and queries against the week table typically take uh, a couple megs, a couple hundred megs. If you start going against the, the week or all table uh, and getting like literally everything for everything, you can start to consume uh, tens of gigabytes. 
Do those depend, by the way, on how you do your query? They, they do, and I'm not, I do not take, uh, I, I'm about to make like children cry and puppy dogs like scream when I show you the queries that I, I <laughs> use for this stuff. Uh, so I wanted to take a quick look at the query and show you an example of how like, um, I can take a look at all of the, select count star is count, and then job is job name, and then just group by the job name, and that way I can see literally all of the, uh, let's order by job count desk, in fact. So I can see like, what are all of the jobs that end up in this big query table? Literally all of them, I don't care what's running them, I don't care how they're kicked off. And cool, now I can see that we have, you know, in the past week, we've had a couple thousand runs of many jobs that have the word Kubernetes in them, uh, and one job that doesn't. And there are, uh, I can't see it because of my screen, but there are like thousands of results that it should be saying somewhere down here. Um, okay, so uh, I wrote this awful query that looks more like this, which, hang on, sorry. Uh, Zoom is being annoying. <laughs> Apologize for the demo flail. Um, okay, it's this one. Uh, so this is a job that takes a look at um, literally everything in the build.all data set uh, that started uh, since some timestamp, which I'll get to, uh, and started sort of before right now. Um, it's finished because its elapsed time isn't null, and I don't even know why I have two hands here. Um, and then things that I'm collecting about all of these jobs are things like the 50th percentile of the job's duration, 75th percentile of the job's duration, 99th percentile of the job's duration, uh, for uh, every job aggregated by day. And then I start to aggregate that so I can get like the count of runs of each job. And then I can start to count the number of past runs of each job. Same for tests and tests with uh, tests and tests that failed within each job to finally give me things like the failure rate of jobs and the failure rate of tests within a job. Um, this was based on work that Cole did uh, with his metrics thing. So if I go to Kubernetes test infra um, metrics, you'll see a big query that looks a little bit like that as an example of there's this YAML file that describes some big query that you can run uh, the results of that will then be piped through JQ, both just to get like a JSON file of the results for today, as well as some JQ to generate a measurements file that is capable of being dumped into InfluxDB. Um, and so, for example, uh, something that's pretty close to what I wrote would be the pre-submit health JSON file, which shows PRs and runs and, and durations and stuff of uh, pre-submit jobs, and then the config looks relatively similar. Lots of nested selects and regular extraction, extraction, extraction stuff. So um, we then have this thing called Velodrome, which is a Grafana instance pointed at the InfluxDB instance that we store all that data into. And this is the dashboard that everybody looks at today. And it can show us things like, in theory, how flaky is a pull request, in theory, what are the pull request jobs that have been failing the longest? For the uh, flakiest pull request jobs, you know, which ones have the most actual flakes? So this can teach people, like, if they want to make the biggest difference to the project right now and improve everybody's merge velocity, they should go figure out why the test volume provision test is uh, failing or flaking. Getting rid of this would make everything better. The fact that everything else is staged in timeout is not super actionable by our contributors and something I would like to improve, but certainly is a sign to us that something about our setup test infrastructure prior to creating a cluster uh, isn't working very well. Um, so on and so forth. Uh, so using the horrible query that I constructed, I wanted something that was a little more relevant to the release team to show uh, stuff, sorry, that's merge blocking, uh, stuff that is release blocking. Um, and so I have sort of the failure rates for all of the jobs that are on the release blocking dashboard. I have, uh, at the moment, hard-coded what this list of jobs is. 
here and into this dropdown. Uh, but this is something that Grafana could, in theory, like query an endpoint to get a list of jobs given some criteria. Uh, so I could see like asking an endpoint, hey, what are all the job names that are on, what are all the test group names on the secretly master blocking test group dashboard? And I would expect something to give you that back, uh, which is what would let me focus on things like, I'll just compare the GCE and the integration test, because I think those are pretty boring box standard things. And so you can see um, that the GCE job, the green one here, is going above this threshold line. This threshold line is a failure rate of 25%, which is based on the release blocking criteria I said earlier. If this fails over 25% of the time, it's not really meeting its criteria as a release blocking job. In theory, that should be a failure rate over a time period. And right now I'm just looking back at the last 30 days. I could look back at the last 90 days and see something that's hopefully a little bit more charitable. No, not really. It's still pretty much the same average. Um, also get the release blocking flake rate for these jobs. Uh, so again, I can tell that the integration master job seems to be the current most flakiest job between these two. And if I go back to just see all the jobs, I can see that it's still the flakiest job out of everything, followed by these. Um, next, something that looks similar to the last thing, a list of all of the flakes for all of the release blocking jobs, which one has the most flakes, and thus where you could make the biggest difference by fixing a given thing. Um, and finally, some stuff that is uh, two other graphs that relate to release blocking durations. One shows the 99th percentile of the duration of the job and tells me that like this, uh, this GCE serial job is taking almost 10 hours. Not quite, but almost. That doesn't seem great. If I remove that, the alpha features job is also taking somewhere up to three hours to finish its run. So maybe that's something we should also consider kicking out. The slow job is also pretty close to that. Once I've done this, these are all the jobs that actually fall under the threshold of maximum duration we're willing to allow for release blocking jobs. And so this is what's going to allow the release team to figure out like, hey, do we still care about these jobs? We should go figure out who owns the tests in these jobs and maybe like some tests need to be kicked out. Maybe we should stop paying attention to these jobs. Um, and this shows the average interval between the jobs, uh, the job runs. Um, so if I get rid of that and that, you see these spiky things here? These turn out to be our basal test and our basal build jobs, uh, which are apparently, I just discovered thanks to this graph yesterday, are not actually the periodic versions of this job, they're the post-submit versions of this job. So this is actually telling me like roughly how often are things getting committed into uh, Kubernetes because the job only gets kicked off as a post-submit when the commit lands, which is, this is basically showing the weekends. <laughs> is the TLDR. But if I get rid of those things, you can see, and I get rid of the serial job because it's taking forever to run, you can see most everything else falls under the threshold of it gets kicked off at least every three hours. The final thing this lets me see is the average number of tests that get run uh, for these jobs. Uh, so I can tell that somebody's added a number of test cases to the integration test recently. Uh, and this is the sort of thing that I wanted to use to like just focus on the GCE, the end to end testing for a second and drop my duration way out to like the last two years. This is, like, this is what lets me see like the number of tests that get run in this job are sort of monotonically increasing. And then if I were to focus on the GCE job in the duration, I can see that the duration of the job is also kind of monotonically increasing. And so this is what would maybe help us to determine when it is time to kind of adjust what we're running in this job and why. I have a similar dashboard for merge blocking jobs. Um, it is slightly different metrics than the first dashboard that I showed you uh, because it turns out the first dashboard cared about how many pull requests ended up flaking. I only care about how many invocations of the job ended up flaking. Um, but I think of most interest here might be like which pull request jobs are taking an entirely like way too long. Like apparently most people, at least 99% of people are waiting about two hours for this job to finish on their pull requests. And if they're not waiting for that, they're waiting about two hours for this like 100 node scalability job to finish. 
If they're not waiting for that, they're waiting about 100 minutes for the end-to-end -end job to finish. Uh, so I'm hoping that with a dashboard like this, we can kind of get a better idea of are our tests really helping us out? Are they actually being meaningful? And because we just talked about test grid a lot, it's kind of unclear to me how much of this should continue to live in a dashboard like this versus how much of this should be actionable intelligence that comes from a tool like test grid. Uh, but this is, you know, this is sort of the thing that developed because the summarizer was closed source and we wanted to make sure that the community was empowered to add like whatever queries, whatever metrics that they want. Um, so I'm going to run this by the release team and see if they like it. Um, and uh, hopefully with that walkthrough, I've demonstrated how if you want to add some other metrics and stuff of your own, uh, you can see how to do that. Any questions? Okay. Um, the last thing I had on the agenda was to talk about KubeCon sessions. Um, the maintainer track uh, gives every SIG the ability to have an intro session and a deep dive session. Uh, something that's newer this year, though, is we may be able to do deep dive sessions for individual subprojects. So I was thinking it might be a good idea to have an intro session and have a deep dive session for Prowl and have a deep dive session for Kind. Uh, and I was talking with the folks from the Testing Commons subproject. They'd like to have a session as well. Does that sound cool to everybody? And does anybody want to volunteer to speak at any of these sessions? It equals a free speaker ticket. So you'd have to like figure out how to travel to the conference. But otherwise, you'll get in for sure. OK. Uh, folks can ping me offline about that. Um, that was everything that I had on the agenda. Does anybody have anything else? Okay. Thanks, everybody, for your time. I'll see you again in two weeks. Happy Tuesday. Yay.